Hey, what's up everyone? My channel got two strikes on them and on them, on one, on my, my channel, I have two copyright strike. I can't stream on YouTube anymore. So here we are on Twitch and here we're gonna be forever, I guess. F YouTube, I hate you, you suck. Oh wait, did I, oh crap, did I just say the F word within the first 30 seconds of the video? F YouTube, F YouTube. I need to make sure to bleep out that because I am going to post this on YouTube. Uh oh. All right. Uh oh. What are you? I've been trying to reach you for five days, five fucking days, and nothing. Where are my kids, Frank? Where are my fucking kids? Fucking kids? Fucking kids? Wait, what? Li liminal, liminal land? Wait, what is this? The heck is liminal land? Oh, oh, is it a merch? Is it merch? Yeah, it's merch. It's a summer day, and you're out for an ocean swim. No one goes out for an ocean swim. One second, let me, let me, sorry, 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 sorry. How do I get rid of this? How do you hide it? Yeah, whatever, I guess it doesn't matter. You take a breath, you head under. I'd rather not. It's beautiful at first. You're in a whole new world. You keep going and going. I don't wanna. And going. I don't wanna. As you come up for air, you notice the people behind you are quiet as nature's ambience has overtaken them. You just need one more look though. And alas, you take one more plunge. I, no, I'm good. I think I'd rather but just it not. It seems that you be may have there. had a slight miscalculation. As your eyes draw into focus, you realize that there's nothing to focus on no floor no fish no walls all yeah. there is is a void of darkness yeah that's a, a big cold, nope. endless abyss gazing back at you it's a big nope from me there dog. is nothing there but yourself the water and the vast unknown you know, I was actually going to make a video about this. I'm not going to lie. I, I actually was planning on making a video about the fear of the ocean. But, dude, after Nexpo did it, he's going to do it so much better than me. So, I'll just watch. I'll just watch and enjoy instead. Ew! Ew! Stop! What's worse, ocean or forest? See, at least in the forest, I don't have to worry about drowning. And I could, you know, I'm 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 in a calm I I know where I like I'm I'm on land. I know what I'm I somewhat know what I'm doing. You know, at least you're on land. But in the ocean, dude, like what are you gonna do? You're just floating. You're literally just floating. Like, and you just have to rely on on your on your strength in order to stay afloat, but you could just chill out in the woods for a few days and be fine. But out in the ocean, nah. Nah, like maybe 24 hours, you're done. Evolve. Just you know, grow gills. It's funny. I've been trying to figure out for years how to put into words the existential dread I get from something as conceptually simple as the ocean. The 
immeasurable expanse that remains one of the world's greatest mysteries. It is painfully unsettling that our current knowledge of it is minuscule, rivaling that of the moon, and even the planet Mars. Upon looking at the raw data, knowing that over 80% of this underwater abyss remains unmapped and unexplored to this day, drives home the gut-wrenching realization that we truly know next to nothing about what's actually down there. We know more about the surface of a planet we have never set foot on than we do about the ocean engulfing the vast majority of the planet on which we live. And to me, that implication is horrifying. It's called the deep blue for a reason, because it is incomprehensibly so. At just over 36,000 feet straight down, you can fit the entirety of Mount Everest with over 7,000 feet to spare. You could theoretically launch a jumbo jet off the bottom of the ocean's deepest point and hardly make it to surface level at its cruising altitude. And if you stack the Empire State Building end to end, you would need over 24 of them, one on top of the other, to reach surface level from its darkest abyss. Yeah. The lassophobia is a concept that encompasses the fear. Why is that? We'd rather go to space and fully explore our own planet? Well, the ocean's hard bruh it's hey it's it's liquid bruh you know it's difficult I feel, I feel like that's why like you know it's not like people aren't searching the ocean it's not like they're just like ah i mean whatever we see it all the time it's probably fine no they're actively searching all the time it's a skill issue you're right it's just a skill issue that we don't that we haven't explored the ocean that much but i mean mars all you gotta do is just like take a big picture of it and then you got the surface. That's it. You're done. The ocean, it's like, you gotta, you gotta dive. You gotta go every, it's like, it's crazy. A lot of stuff going on down there. ...of the ocean. Yet what it actually entails might mean something entirely different to you than it does to me. Yeah, space is easy. Some may fear the ocean's gargantuan, seemingly endless size. Or fear nature's unforgiving wrath. Dude. Oh my god! I I remember just wa like watch. I remember I was watching videos of like sh like really big ships out in the ocean, like with waves like that. Oh god! I fuck that man. Fuck that. Or fear becoming stuck within it. Or fear things that don't belong inside of it. I don't really or care fear about that. We found. I I yeah, I don't like that. Or rather fear what we haven't yeah the fuck much of what we think of when we imagine the ocean are visuals that we can logically comprehend reference points like coral reefs the seafloor and even sea creatures that share this world with us help us paint a mental picture that is coherent in reality though once you tread off the beaten path and veer over the continental shelf separating our world from theirs What's actually out there is a seemingly infinite void and a macrocosm that we may never fully explore. All across the internet, we can find troves of video demonstrating the ocean's colossal scale. It's hard to put exactly into words, but viewing footage of divers like Jonathan Byrne treading the fringe of- Yeah, I know about that. The, the, the further you go down, the bigger things get. I mean, that's mainly because how the pressure is. Well, I remember watching a video of, like, what the deepest fish that they found was. Dude, I can't imagine. Oh, yeah, it, it was like they brought the the fish that live, like, the deepest part of the ocean and brought it up to the surface, and it just, like, exploded. It just, like, died. Just fell apart. Because they're so used to that insane pressure. Safety and complete danger by venturing out and into what appears to be completely nothing will never not cause me to tense up. There is the an entire fish? world below Oh, them. I don't know about that. Was that, was that what that was? A world shrouded in darkness. A world ripe for discovery. A world with caves, valleys, entire underwater oceans, and man-made relics, all just waiting there until the end of time. Yeah, why 
All I need is make a water breathing potion, true. Danky King. Since I was a child, the Lassophobia has unknowingly held me with an iron grip. Jolly Roger Bay and its feeling of constant tension as we oh, explore yeah. a man-made creation ravaged by nature. Pinnacle Rock and its cavernous gorge infested with creatures unknown. And Tomb Raider with its multitude of claustrophobic underwater caverns oh, I remember disorienting that. us at every turn. Dude, it's funny because paradoxically, I have always suck, felt man. that the soundtracks to these levels are beautiful, which oddly always counteracted the dread I got from having to endure environments like this. Perhaps it was the fact that in these games, we are almost always- Actually, I honestly stopped playing Subnautica whenever you got out into the deep, like, like, you know, the actual huge ocean portion. That's when I was like, bro, I don't know if I could do this anymore. <laughs> That's when it got scary. It's racing the clock, lest we drown to death when our time is up. With the fact that enemies always move faster oh, than we do. Oh, yeah. Or maybe it's the lack that of visibility. Good. The darkness that shrouds us just feet away, depriving us of any ability to prepare for an impending I threat. start Subnautica up again, maybe. Or could it be? The creatures... The monsters who call this unforgiving habitat home. Dude. Oh yeah, Soma is a really good game too. <clears throat> do it for the views? Dude, what do you mean? Dude, gaming? You think In gaming gets me views? No. A video game You're released crazy. encompassing every fear that I have ever had regarding the ocean. Oh, it's... Oh, uh, I know what he's going to say. It's Iron Lung. Is he going to talk about Iron Lung? It's called Iron Lung. Yep. Yeah, he's going to talk about Iron Lung. Dude, people have been, like, talking about this game like crazy. I think even Pyrocynical made a video about it, didn't he? You may have heard of it through my fellow creators like Markiplier, Pyrocynical, and yep. Jacob Geller. I saw Jacob Geller. The game Geller's puts us video. into the shoes of a convict, trapped in a world far removed from ours. At the game's beginning, we're told that, out of nowhere, every single habitable planet was demolished in a cataclysmic event known only as the Quiet Rapture. With this, the future of humankind was left dangling by a threat, as only those aboard spacecrafts were safe from it. For years, the remaining survivors have done what they could to jumpstart humanity, navigating the vast frontier that is the yeah, universe. Yeah, it's such a simple game, but it's so terrifying. That a habitable planet remains out there. Guided by nothing but dying starlight, mankind is confined to the vast expanse of nothingness, left to salvage the scant resources left behind on a multitude of barren moons. But on just a handful of them, we find a strange anomaly. Oceans of blood that might be the key to unlocking the resources we so desperately need to survive. You and I are tasked with boarding a makeshift submarine that was not designed for extreme depth, navigating an ocean that is completely alien from anything we have ever seen or known, oh, left to search for and photograph natural resources that may not even be down there. To add insult to injury, the submarine will be welded shut and the window reinforced with thick metal. A rolling method of navigation, a map, a rudimentary control system, a single camera, and our own intuition, guided by whatever sounds we may hear down there. For all we know, we may not survive, but inside the iron lung, at least we won't know what killed us. Jump scare? Okay. Beginning at descent. I thought he was going to spoil the jump scare at the end. Cruising depth in roughly 40 seconds. Stand by. Um, I'm seeing some voltage irregularities in the instruments, so keep an eye out for sparks or flames or anything like that. Edging jump scare? That's depth. pretty much the whole game. Uh, the whole feeling it, but it's still holding strong. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Nexpo doesn't use jump scares. I always hate, like, a anything that has jump scares. Actually, the only thing I didn't like about Iron Lung was the end. 
when you died to like the thing that pops out. I feel like the best way for it to end would be like the power goes out and then it's just like you lose. You know what I mean? Like, or like, you know, you're implied that you just die down there. That would be a really cool way to end the game. Spoilers? Dude, everyone's fucking seen this, this game. Everyone's talked about it a billion times. Dude, that would be the best way to do it, though. Closing porthole shielding. The light going out suddenly is kind of a jump scare. We're starting to lose radio signal. Not like You'll the jump scare at the end of the game. So thing and be careful. You're on your own. The jump scare at the end of the game is really cheap. From the very beginning, we know this will not be simple. The iron lung flexes and creaks, seemingly reaching its limit under the crippling weight of the ocean. The radio cuts out, severing our only line of communication, and letters penned by previous convicts warn us of an impending fate. For the entire game, we're left to follow a map, adjusting our rotation as we blindly navigate this foreign underwater sea in hopes of taking pictures at each designated point. Interestingly, the iron lung is equipped with a proximity sensor to warn us when we come too close to an obstacle. And at first, it seems like a no-brainer. The ship is already cruising on its last leg, so any physical contact couldn't spell the end of us altogether. As we make our way to each checkpoint, we're able to utilize a shoddy camera system to view the outside world. And with intervals of just one blood single ocean? frame, yeah, take the we're left with nothing but grainy, black and white visuals that are more often than not, completely inexplicable. A corpse of a foreign giant. Unknown structures with monsters just out of view. Legs from what appear to be giant spiders. Mm. and objects that bear no discernible shape. There's something about low polygon games that are just pure horror, yeah. Low poly games are just always mm. scary. No, fuck no. The horror of Iron Lung comes interwoven within the very fabric of how it's played. We are confined to an iron cell left with none other than the dread stemming from our own biases as our minds fill the blanks these grainy Katie. images leave for us. And on top of this, as we traverse this underwater hell, that proximity sensor sure goes wild, even when we're certain there's no obstacle anywhere around us. Bruh. Whatever is out there is lurking, analyzing us for just the right moment. We cannot see them, we cannot prepare, and we have yeah, no I, idea what it is. I, I got banned on, on off YouTube for streaming because I got two strikes. If you want to know more about it, uh, you could watch the VOD after stream, or uh, I'm probably just going to post it on my second channel, explaining it a bit more. Around us. In a way, it's sort of poetic because it resembles the real world. Blood oceans upon vast alien moons aren't too far off from the concept of our own. And I think that's what makes Iron Lung so horrifying. Anytime we enter the ocean, we enter a habitat yeah, not made for us. Realistic. We can't breathe. We can't hear. We can't see. But they can. I hate it. I hate Tonight, it. I won't spoil the ending. So if you haven't yet experienced this game, please do. Okay, well, I spoiled the ending already. <laughs> all I said was there was a jump scare. Okay, that's it. That's all I said. That's the end. I mean, there's a lot more to it. Okay? There's a lot more to it. Sorry. Ban yourself for spoiling. I didn't think it was that much of a spoiler. I'm sorry. Because it'll be well worth your time. Just, the, story the game is, is good. And all right. 
The atmosphere is unmatched for those matter. afraid of the deep. And the ending has a catch that will stick with you for a while. In my opinion... And I he's talking about the story ending. He's not talking about like how the game actually ends, alright? There's more to it, alright? Iron Lung is one of the greatest modern examples of thalassophobia portrayed through video games. And as an avid fan of Subnautica, that sure saying something. Yeah. Uh. It, that part in Subnautica, like when you go to the deep part, uh. Oh! Oh! Hidden inside the second chapter of Slug Girl, part of the whole world of Junji Ito collection. Oh, uh, here we go. Story. Junji Ito. The thing that drifted ashore. Oh, if he wrote about it involves the tale this type of a mysterious stuff. object that washes up uh, on the coast okay. of the Pacific Ocean. I've heard of this one. It's a creature completely alien. It's gargantuan, slimy. It's disgusting. On its face are massive cysts and tumors with small appendages emerging from them. And worst of all, it smells because it's rotting. Nevertheless, it draws a crowd in the hundreds, it's a all no eager fish, yeah. to examine and preserve this colossal spectacle. It's about to get bad. Among the crowd, we encounter a young boy with an acute fear of the ocean. All his life, He's had nightmares of floating in the deep sea, surrounded by horns of massive ocean giants. <clears throat> While out there, this hole is made for me. Oh Yang. god, dude, I hate that she one. She explains that, that seven years prior, she had lost her fiance in a ferry accident. No trace of him was ever found. However, ever since, she's been afflicted with ocean nightmares highly similar to the boys. As she's telling her story, though. The onlookers notice something. The creature's skin has transparent spots. And on the inside are humans entirely intact. They cut the creature open. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's a mistake. The people are still alive, and it's realized that one of them is B.A.'s fiance, the one who went missing years ago. Shortly after, the bile-covered people begin to panic crawling in all sorts of directions like inhuman monsters. As it turns out, they were trapped inside of this thing for years, living off it like parasites as they traversed the pitch black deep ocean. And the dreams they had of the ocean giants larger than a school bus were in actuality what those inside of it were seeing all those years. Because of their confinement, every person recovered that day was officially declared insane. And the story ends pondering on what else might be out there. That's excellent writing. Dude, Junji Ito, I don't know how he does it. He picks the weirdest stuff. The weirdest, like the spiral shit. Like it's such a, 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 like a dumb concept when you just look at it as a basic thing. But how he writes it is so fucking scary. Like, I don't know how he comes up with this shit. Like, it's, it's such a weird concept and a simple one, but man, it fucks with you. Yeah, Uzumaki. That's, that's the one that's the spiral. The thing that drifted ashore is special because its horror is twofold. On one hand, we have an ocean monster that lives off shipwrecked human beings. 
yet on the other, we have the visual of what they saw all confined down there. Grotesque, giant fish with massive eyes and appendages. Beasts capable Uzumaki of devouring me entire human beings. It didn't really scare me, it more like disturbed Beyond our me, level of comprehension. The ocean is which uniquely is why I fascinating like because it's the one medium on Earth more in which fact can be fantasy. Scary. Ocean monsters can be thought into existence with hardly a way to disprove them within our lifetime. And the potential of what could be overpowers our collective psyche as that curiosity may never be satiated. It seems that until the end of time, legendary ocean monsters like the Kraken, the Hydra, and the Leviathan will always fascinate us given our sheer inability to explore the habitat in which they live. Tales of the high seas, of tragedy, by the hands of fantastical beasts will persist evermore, fueling fans and fears of the ocean for generations to come. The thing that drifted ashore nails this mistake in the realm of legend, sea. yet it plays on concepts entirely grounded in reality. Deep sea giants are not fiction, and the condition of abyssal gigantism is in actuality the farthest thing from fantasy. Yep. Dude, he, God, he's 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 taking every single point of why I hate the ocean and just like, man, this is why I'll never live on the coast. <laughs> I might, maybe not. Around three thousand feet deep, the ocean becomes cold, dark and full of creatures inexplicable. In lieu of the octopi, dolphins, and vibrant ecosystems embedded within coral reefs, we instead find species exhibiting bioluminescence, bearing foreboding teeth, and riddled with a curious affliction. Colossal size. See, the only look at the bright side about all this shit is all of these animals or sea creatures that live super deep, they'll never be able to come to the surface. That's the only thing that I'm like, all right with, you know what I mean? Like, they'll, they just won't be able to because they're, you know, they're the, 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 the pressure of the bottom of the ocean is what's keeping them together. These photos, and it's difficult to establish a sense of scale. The colossal squid alone looks relatively unassuming until you're given a visual comparison respective to a human. The oarfish appears like a minuscule eel until you realize they can grow up to 36 feet long. Jesus Christ. Deep sea gigantism has created a plethora of monsters. Japanese spider crabs bearing 12 foot legs. Deep sea isopods. Wait, oh. hold up. 12 foot? Wait, wait. Wait, 12 foot legs? Wh hey, whoa, hold up, hold up, yo. Just the legs, just one leg is 12 foot. I'm out, dude, Wh what, no. Deep sea gigantism has created a plethora of monsters. Japanese spider crabs bearing 12 foot legs. Deep sea isopods growing multiple feet in length. Sea spiders up to nearly two feet long. Ew! Anglerfish the size of humans. Ew! The big fin squid with tentacles extending upwards of 26 feet long. Ew! And even creatures like the siphonophore a floating amalgamation made of a colony of zooids chaining themselves together hundreds of feet in length. For over 90% of the ocean, sunlight is not able to penetrate, fostering an environment in which life like this needs to adapt to survive. 
A region known as the Abyssal Plain makes up 70% of the entire sea floor as we know it. However, because of the lack of sunlight, plants and vegetation simply cannot thrive down there. This, in a way, presents a natural conundrum as the bottom of the food chain typically relies on flora for satiation. And so, this is where a phenomenon known as marine snow comes into play. Made up of decomposed organisms from above, on top of fecal matter, sand, and the remains of fish, most of the known deep ocean fauna rely on it as their main source of food. Oh. With this in mind, it would only make sense for creatures to evolve by shrinking, as not only are they compressed by the ocean's sheer weight, but are also left devoid of solid meals. As we've seen though, reality is quite the opposite. Kleber's law states that the larger an organism's mass is, the more efficient its metabolic rate becomes. This notion results in colossal, highly efficient sea life lurking within the ocean's darkest depths, waiting and grazing for their next meal. God, dude, what the fuck I would be remiss, are those however, eyes? if I did not state that these are mere postulations, as the phenomenon of abyssal gigantism is still being studied. Because of the historical impossibility of exploring the deep ocean, much of how sea life survives down there is entirely All depth unknown. In the water? Alongside this, it's believed that. that over 91% of the ocean species have not even been discovered, compounding with the already extraordinary statistic that the vast majority of the deep blue remains completely unseen by human eyes. Up to this point, Everything I've shown you in this video has fallen within the mere 9% of creatures we have seen. Oh, good! Now imagine what we haven't. I'd rather not. Godzilla's probably resting nicely down there. <clears throat> Dude, there's gotta be like a Godzilla sized something down there. It goes without saying that the ocean is treacherous, yet that hasn't slowed those eager to explore it. The allure of underwater caves, blue holes, and ocean cliff sides make for an experience both riveting and spiritually fulfilling. However, it's unfortunately fairly common for deep sea dives to go awry. Here we go. Deep sea dives, man. Oh, man. On the 28th of April, 2000, 22-year-old Yuri Lipsky geared up for a dive within the Blue Hole in Egypt. Known as one of the most dangerous diving locations in the world, traversing- I think we've, we've talked about this one, right? I this think. environment is no small feat. One of its standout features is its underwater <sighs> arch, a massive 170-foot tunnel resting 164 feet below the surface and extending 85 feet in length. It's been reported is this that the, the blue hole is deceptive, appearing to be much shorter than it is when you manage to get down there. Alongside this, it bears areas with strong down currents, making for a physically grueling experience. When inside, depth and oxygen monitoring are a must, yet Lipsky, fully aware of the risks involved with such an intensive dive, maintained optimism in his physical ability. Uh-oh. At 5.03 p.m., Lipsky embarks into the depths. Contrary to standard procedure, he attempts this dive, not in a group, but alone. Oh, that's good. For the first two minutes, we can observe Yuri swimming parallel to surface until he's over the deepest point of the blue hole. He then begins a slow controlled descent before he begins releasing air from his BCD, or buoyancy compensation device, Oh wait, this also might be the one where we actually see, like he's, 
he has the camera and you like see the moment that he and realizes that he's faster. fucked. point, his regulator begins to work harder to supply Yuri with the increased amount of oxygen he's taking in, evident by the numerous wheezes we hear throughout this footage. By now, he is descending rapidly, likely more so than he realizes. And soon after, the alarm from his dive monitor sounds, signaling that his depth is reaching a critical level. That's him wheezing. Is he still going down? God, the sounds, dude. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah, okay, so this is the one. So this is the one I was thinking of. Okay. Yeah, this one is sad. Yuri is now over 270 feet below surface, signaling a multitude of inconvenient truths. The oxygen in his tank is quickly becoming toxic. His buoyancy is dwindling, and an effect known as nitrogen narcosis is plaguing him, instilling a sensation of yeah. complete drunkenness. Yeah, he starts getting confused. And then he just, yeah, okay, I remember this. Okay. At 5.09 p.m., Yuri approaches the bottom of the blue hole and over 300 feet deep. Immediately, he fully inflates his BCD in hopes of returning to the surface. However, it's entirely ineffective as the downforce of the ocean negates any semblance of buoyancy. This realization appears to cause him to panic because his tank is now empty. He's disoriented. Yuri Lipsky is trapped. Not being able to breathe? Dude, I'm literally like feeling claustrophobic right now just watching this shit. Oh my god. I do not like it when nature murders. I mean, not trying to be like, hey, like, you know, it's kind of his fault. But I, every time something like this happens, it's always because someone doesn't take precautions. And are like, oh, yeah, I, I got it. No, no worries. And then they end up, you know, something like this. Yeah, overconfidence. And not taking nature seriously. That's how so many people die. This guy seemed to be skilled in diving. Why would you do it alone? Because Yuri he Lipsky is skilled at diving. In one of the most dangerous diving locations in the world, he embarked to set a personal record to achieve a depth that he had never before seen. Yet in that pursuit, lost his life to the grueling conditions of the deep blue. Since the incident, Yuri's body was recovered. However, the same can't be said for a multitude of others that have met the same fate. Online, you can find footage of divers discovering the remains of their counterparts with their gear still intact. And it's haunting knowing that if those specific divers did not dive in that specific spot, their remains may have never been found, forever confined to the pitch black crypt 
that is the deep sea. Man, I guess more power to people who actually do this shit because I would I would never. Like maybe maybe I would shallow dive, you know, like do like a little shallow dive. But uh anything below 5 feet 10 feet tops. Done. Hey, there's a dead body. Same time tomorrow, Phil. <laughs> Humanity and the ocean have a bizarre relationship with death. Oh, are we talking about tsunamis now? Superstorms leveling entire cities. Gargantuan waves rocking man's largest ships like a bath time toy. And rogue waves that emerge from nowhere, destroying even the largest and safest of oil rigs. To this day, remnants of over 3 million shipwrecks exist on the sea floor, with thousands upon thousands of massive man-made objects accompanying them. Much like the remains of divers, these relics imply and signify defeat and death, lost by the hand of an environment we had set out to tame, and an everlasting token. Yeah, tsunamis film. are fucking scary. Another reason why I don't want to live by the coast. You never know when that There's shit's gonna happen. an interesting subset of thalassophobia called submechanophobia that delves into the very specific fear of encountering oh, yeah. these relics in the wild. It's this primordial repulsion caused by the crippling uncanniness of an object that does not belong, compounded with the lack of any ability to determine its true size. Here's a video made Photo by Nexpo. Of the Titanic. I've watched a lot of his videos. Animatronics of ancient relics, of massive anchor, of sunken airplanes, and the interior of shipwrecks are effectively fueling a newer, more recently discovered phobia made possible by the rise of cameras able to document them. Wow. But it isn't always abandoned structures though, as video, like this one, fuck is happening oh shit oh shit oh shit also exemplify this phobia in its purest form for me personally sub mechanophobia persists because of the total inability to fully see an object Submarine. as it truly is like we touched on earlier our minds are hardwired to fill in blanks with what could be, and more often than not, we achieve this with the most horrifying possible outcome. On land, fog is always seen as a mood setter for the strange and mysterious. And inside the darkest confines of the deep blue, perhaps we can see this idea at work here too. Strange, dark, and mysterious? Question mark? It's hard no worries, to find petrified. The words to I'm just gonna stick to Twitch the from the now on. In just a single YouTube video, as there are so many ways we can and have taken it. Whether it's the fear of sea life, or its infinite size, or how dark it is, or how much we truly don't know about it, or its capability of devastation, or its grip on human life. One thing has and will always hold true. The ocean is fucking horrifying. True. It's an unforgiving frontier harboring some of the most harrowing life and environmental enigmas on the planet. It is and always will be one of life's great mysteries. An entire world we share yet know so little about. The vast majority of the planet yet completely uninhabitable by mankind. Throughout history, it's been said that the moment you enter the ocean, you enter the food chain. 
yet yep. contrary to how it is on land. In their world, in their vast abyss of darkness, humankind is nowhere near the top. Mankind is not meant to be in the water yet. I like it. You know, I like it up here. I like it on the land, you know. And also the concept that, like, a fucking meteor or some shit can land in the ocean, and then the ocean could just be like, yeah, I'm just gonna, like, flood the entire planet. I hope that's fine. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.